We see from the very beginning that the word of the Lord comes to Abram. And this happens to people differently. While it did happen in the Bible, God still speaks to people today through his word and dreams. This should be seen as a reassurance as God is ensuring that his promise happens. And this verse details a deep conversation between Abram and God. Here, the word of the Lord comes to Abram in a vision. And God tells Abram not to fear because he is Abram's shield. Abram had just defeated a much larger army made up of a partnership of four kings. He had reason to be afraid, expecting an attack of retribution. But it is God that goes forward and fights for us. He is our protector and shield. God knows what Abram is expecting, or at least thinking. And because of Abram defeating four kings, attack was probably expected so God explains he will protect Abram as his shield. And because Abram just turned down a lot of reward, God will see to it that he is rewarded. Charles Spurgeon wrote, If God be our reward, let us take care that we do really enjoy him. Let us exult in him, and let us not be pining after any other joy. Abram asks God what will he get in return which is not a question of greed, I do not believe. But Abram wanted something more than finances and riches and wealth, but he wanted a son. At some point, every man begins to think about their legacy and what they will leave behind. And to whom, and it appears that Abram was doing this here. Eliezer of Damascus, his servant is a good man, an honorable man. But he is not a son to Abram, it appears that of all the things he could have. A son is the most important. Abram is bold about his statement, which should be an example of prayer. I'm not sure that Abram was mad. Or angry at God, maybe so. But it's clear that he was frustrated with the current situation. And at his age, I'm sure it wasn't any easier. And maybe Abram was doubting certain things. But there is a difference between a doubt that denies God's promises and a doubt that desires after God's promises. Studying this chapter helped me understand this principle as I had not ever thought about it in this sense. God reassures Abram with this explanation. Abram's heir will be his actual, literal son, his own flesh and blood. As it was with Abram, and as it is with us today, God's promises will come to fruition. But it's in his timeline, not ours. Just because things have not come together yet does not mean they will not. Abram needed reminded just like we need reminded at times. This promise was repeated to Abram with such certainty that it was reasonable to suppose that he expected it would be soon fulfilled. But it would be another 15 years before this event would take place. When God instructs Abram to count the stars and the dust, God is reassuring Abram that his offspring would be so numerous as to be uncountable. Abram believed this promise from God and this made him righteous as we've seen earlier with Noah. And his righteousness, it was not because of perfection, but instead, faith. And loyalty to God that made these men righteous. And each of us can be righteous in front of a perfect God. Here is the first time belief is used in the Bible. And the first time righteousness is used in the Bible. And God is clear that he did not deliver Abram from the past for nothing. Or, a God explains it, he brought Abram out of his old life, his former home, for this very purpose, to get him and his descendants land. Spurgeon writes what? Abraham, is not God's promise sufficient for thee? Ah, beloved! Faith is often marred by a measure of unbelief or, if not quite unbelief. Yet there is a desire to have some token, some sign, beyond the bare promise of God. Abram is righteous in front of God, but he is not a perfect or flawless being. And while he believed, he had no deed or certificate that said this land belonged to him. We read from in the next verse formalizing that covenant promise. The first step in this verse 
is a list of animals Abram was to bring before the Lord, a heifer, goat, and ram, each three years old, along with a turtle dove and young pigeon. The processes which follow emphasize the seriousness of this promise on the part of God. It also includes a surprising prophecy about the future of Abram's large family. While this verse may read like a shopping list, the symbolism was clear. First, this is a covenant so serious, it is sealed with blood. Second, if I break this covenant, let this same bloodshed be poured out on my animals and me. This is how God works as he makes a covenant, and he sees it through, and that it is protected. Abram had reason to expect that God would come down and walk through the animal parts with him, because God had previously appeared to him in some way of the first few verses. Spurgeon sums up like this, perhaps he did not doubt the promise, but he wanted to have it explained to him. He may have wondered if it meant that one born in his house, though not his son, was to be his heir and that, through him, the blessing would come. He takes the opportunity of making an inquiry that he may know how to act. At the same time, there does seem to be a clashing between Abraham's question, What wilt thou give me? And the declaration of God, I am thy shield. And thy exceeding great reward. There is a great descent from the language of the Lord to that of the most stable believer. And when you and I are even at our best, I have no doubt that. If all could be recorded that we think and say, some of our fellow believers would feel that the best of men are, but men at the best, and that God's language is after a nobler fashion than ours will ever be, till we have seen his face in glory. Spurgeon explains of the covenant made here between Abram and God of what's asked, here is a lesson for us. Perhaps you have some of these unclean birds coming down upon your sacrifice just now. That raven that you did not lock up well at home has come here after you. Eagles and vultures and all kinds of kites in the form of carking cares and sad memories and fears and doubts come hovering over the sacred feast. Drive them away, God give you grace to drive them away by the power of his gracious spirit. Researching the happenings here, we find that there is a reason God asked Abram to do what's instructed. It may appear this was a ceremony-like circumstance. But in these days, contracts were made by the sacrificial cutting of animals, with the split carcasses of the animals lying on the ground. The covenant was made when parties to the agreement walked through the animal parts together, repeating the terms of the covenant. As illustrated in the text, Abram waited for the Lord to appear and walked through the carcasses with him, the signing of the covenant. But God didn't come right away. He had to wait and fight off the vultures until God appeared to complete the covenant ceremony. An important lesson for us is to learn to wait on God and his timing. As evening came, God had not yet appeared to walk through the animal parts with Abram and seal the covenant. Instead, God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Abram. Notice previously that God instructed Abram to look up at the stars, but now, he is sleeping. Now, it appears that Abram seems supernaturally overpowered by a deep sleep, and a great and dreadful darkness. Once in the sleep, Abram is told of some of the hardships that will befall his descendants so this was probably difficult to hear as nobody wants to think their kin will have it rough. But there will be a long rough history for some of these people. But as it was dark, Abram saw God come through the animal parts. And this is the covenant being signed by God. In what this covenant could not fail, because God cannot fail. God makes it clear that the covenant is not a spiritual promise as he names specific areas and lands of Abram's people, so we can rest assured it was not a figurative promise. This promise comes along with God's prior reassurance that Abram will, in fact, see a natural-born son, but like many great things, 
it will take time to complete. And for Abram, he will have to continue to be patient although he had been for so long. As one illustration I found explains God was binding himself to do as he promised no matter what. Abram or Abram's descendants did or did not do. Put another way, this promise from God to the people of Israel to give them this land was a unilateral covenant. As we come to the end of chapter 15, God is defining certain areas and certain groups of people. And again, this is proof that the promise is a real physical one, not just spiritual.